Welcome to Impartial Points and our comprehensive guide to the U.S. Constitution. In this video, we're diving deep into the supreme law of the United States, exploring each article, section, and amendment. The Constitution is the foundation of American government, establishing the rules and principles that govern the country. From outlining the structure of the government to protecting individual rights, this document has shaped the nation for over 230 years. You'll hear the actual text of the entire Constitution in one voice, and then a brief summary in plain English following each section or amendment from me. You'll hear the Constitution as originally written, then you'll get references back to the articles and sections that were affected when we summarize the various amendments. Remember the summaries are just summaries, listen to the original text as well, because there's more detail than in the summaries. Whether you're a student, educator, someone who wants to be an informed citizen, or just curious about the Constitution, this explainer will help you understand the key elements that make it so important. Let's get started. Part 1. The Preamble Before we dive into the articles, let's start with the preamble. The preamble is a brief introductory statement that outlines the Constitution's purpose and guiding principles. It reads, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The preamble sets the stage for the rest of the Constitution. It emphasizes that the power of the government comes from the people and outlines the core goals of the Constitution, unity, justice, peace, defense, welfare, and liberty. It's the promise the U.S. government is supposed to live up to. Article 1. The Legislative Branch Article 1 establishes the legislative branch of the federal government, which is responsible for making laws. This article is divided into 10 sections. Section 1. The Congress All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. The first section establishes a bicameral legislature, meaning there are two houses of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives. This structure ensures a balance of power between states and the people. Section 2. The House of Representatives The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of 25 years and been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years, after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States, and within every subsequent term of ten years, in such manner as they shall by law direct. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every thirty thousand, but each state shall have at least one representative, and until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, Massachusetts eight, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations one, Connecticut five, New York six, New Jersey four, Pennsylvania eight, Delaware one, Maryland six, Virginia ten, North Carolina five, South Carolina five, and Georgia three. When vacancies happen in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. This section outlines the composition of the House of Representatives, where members are elected every two years based on population. It also covers requirements for membership, such as being at least 25 years old and a citizen for seven years. It includes the result of the notorious three-fifth compromise. It also grants the House the power to start impeachment proceedings. Section 3. The Senate The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof, for six years, 
and each senator shall have one vote. Immediately after they shall be assembled in consequence of the first election, they shall be divided as equally as may be into three classes. The seats of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of the second year, of the second class at the expiration of the fourth year, and of the third class at the expiration of the sixth year, so that one-third may be chosen every second year, and if vacancies happen by resignation or otherwise, during the recess of the legislature of any state, the executive thereof may make temporary appointments until the next meeting of the legislature, which shall then fill such vacancies. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained to the age of thirty years and been nine years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state for which he shall be chosen. The vice president of the United States shall be president of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall choose their other officers, and also a president pro tempore, in the absence of the vice president, or when he shall exercise the office of president of the United States. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. The Senate is composed of two senators from each state, serving six-year terms. Senators must be at least 30 years old and U.S. citizens for nine years. The vice president serves as the president of the Senate, but only votes in case of a tie. It grants the Senate the power to try impeachment and sets limits on the punishments that can be imposed. Section 4. Elections and Meetings the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations, except as to the places of choosing senators. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meetings shall be on the first Monday in December, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. This section gives states the power to determine the times, places, and manner of congressional elections. However, Congress can alter these regulations. It also requires Congress to meet at least once a year. Section 5. Powers and Duties of Congress Each House shall be the judge of the elections, returns and qualifications of its own members, and a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business, but a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner, and under such penalties, as each house may provide. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and, with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. Each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings, and from time to time publish the same, accepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy. And the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. Neither house during the session of Congress shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. Each house of Congress sets its own rules, disciplines members, and keeps a journal of proceedings. A majority in each house is needed to conduct business. Section 6. Rights and Disabilities of Members The Senators and Representatives shall receive a compensation for their services to be ascertained by law and paid out of the Treasury of the United States. They shall in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses and in going to and returning from the same. And for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time. And no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either House during his continuance in office.
Members of Congress receive compensation, cannot be arrested during sessions except for serious crimes, and cannot hold any other federal office during their term. This section also includes the speech and debate clause, which immunizes members of Congress for large amounts of their speech. Section 7. Legislative Process All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments, as on other bills. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it, but if not, he shall return it, with his objections to that house in which it shall have originated, who shall enter the objections at large on their journal, and proceed to reconsider it. If, after such reconsideration, two-thirds of that house shall agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent, together with the objections, to the other house, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered, and if approved by two-thirds of that house, it shall become a law. But in all such cases, the votes of both houses shall be determined by yees and nays, and the names of the persons voting for and against the bill shall be entered on the journal of each house respectively. If any bill shall not be returned by the President within ten days, Sundays accepted, after it shall have been presented to him, the same shall be a law, in like manner, as if he had signed it, unless the Congress by their adjournment prevent its return, in which case it shall not be a law. Every order, resolution, or vote to which the concurrence of the Senate and House of Representatives may be necessary, except on a question of adjournment, shall be presented to the President of the United States, and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him or being disapproved by him, shall be repassed by two-thirds of the Senate and House of Representatives, according to the rules and limitations prescribed in the case of a bill. This section outlines how a bill becomes law. All revenue bills must originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate can propose amendments. Once both houses pass a bill, it goes to the President for approval. If the President vetoes it, Congress can override the veto with a two-thirds majority. Section 8. Powers of Congress The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. To borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, to establish an uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States, to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States, to establish post offices and post roads, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, and offenses against the law of nations, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district, not exceeding ten miles square, as may, by session of particular states, and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of the government of the United States, and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state, in which the same shall be, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings, and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, and all other powers vested by this Constitution, 
in the government of the United States, or in any department or officer thereof. Section 8 grants Congress specific powers such as the ability to levy taxes, regulate commerce, coin money, establish post offices, declare war, and raise armies. The Necessary and Proper Clause gives Congress the flexibility to pass laws needed to carry out its enumerated powers. Section 9. Limits on Congress The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended, unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another. Nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. No money shall be drawn from the treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept of any present, emolument, office, or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. This section places limits on Congress's powers, such as prohibiting the suspension of habeas corpus except in emergencies, banning bills of attainder and ex post facto laws, and restricting taxes on exports. Section 10. Limits on the States No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance or confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any title of nobility. No state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports, except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws, and the net produce of all duties and imposts, laid by any state on imports or exports, shall be for the use of the Treasury of the United States. And all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control of the Congress. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war, unless actually invaded, or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. States are prohibited from entering into treaties, coining money, or engaging in war without Congress's consent. This ensures federal supremacy over critical national issues. Article 2, the Executive Branch Article 2 defines the Executive Branch, which is responsible for enforcing laws. Section 1, the President and Vice President The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, and, together with the vice president, chosen for the same term, be elected, as follows. Each state shall appoint, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct, a number of electors, equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. But no senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves, and they shall make a list of all the persons voted for and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be the president, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, 
And if there be more than one who have such majority, and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for president. And if no person have a majority, then from the five highest on the list, the said House shall in like manner choose the president. But in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by states, the representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member, or members, from two-thirds of the states, and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. In every case, after the choice of the president, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the vice president. But if there should remain two or more who have equal votes, the Senate shall choose from them by ballot the vice president. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. No person except a natural-born citizen, or a citizen of the United States, at the time of the adoption of this Constitution, shall be eligible to the office of President. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of thirty-five years and been fourteen years a resident within the United States. In case of the removal of the President from office, or of his death resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the Vice President, and the Congress may by law provide for the case of removal, death, resignation or inability, both of the President and Vice President, declaring what officer shall then act as President, and such officer shall act accordingly, until the disability be removed, or a President shall be elected. The President shall, at stated times, receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States, or any of them. Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation, I do solemnly swear, or affirm, that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. This section outlines the process for electing the president and vice president through the Electoral College. It also covers the qualifications for the presidency, such as being a natural-born citizen, at least 35 years old, and a resident for 14 years. Section 2. Powers of the President The president shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion, in writing, of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices, and he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. He shall have power, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur, and he shall nominate, and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court and all other officers of the United States, whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers, as they think proper, in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. The President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions, which shall expire at the end of their next session. The President serves as the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, has the power to grant pardons, make treaties with Senate approval, and appoint ambassadors, judges, and other officials. Section 3. Duties of the President He shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union, and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses, or either of them, and in case of disagreement between them with respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, and shall commission all the officers of the United States. The President must give a State of the Union address, recommend legislation, convene Congress in special sessions, and ensure laws are faithfully executed. 
Section 4. Impeachment. The President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The President, Vice President, and other civil officers can be impeached and removed from office for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 3. The Judicial Branch. Article 3 establishes the federal judiciary, including the Supreme Court. Section 1. Federal Courts. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. The judicial power is vested in one Supreme Court and any lower courts established by Congress. Judges serve for life, ensuring independence from political pressures. Section 2. Jurisdiction of Federal Courts The judicial power shall extend to all cases, in law and equity, arising under this Constitution the laws of the United States, and treaties made, or which shall be made, under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state or the citizens thereof and foreign states citizens or subjects, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. The trial of all crimes except in cases of impeachment shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed. But when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. This section defines the types of cases federal courts can hear, including those involving the Constitution, federal laws, treaties, and disputes between states. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction in certain cases, such as those involving ambassadors. Section 3. Treason Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act, or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture, except during the life of the person attainted. Treason against the United States is defined as levying war against the country or aiding its enemies. Conviction requires testimony from two witnesses or a confession in open court. Article 4. Relations among the States Article 4 outlines the relationships between states and the federal government. Section 1. Full faith and credit Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state, and the Congress may, by general laws, prescribe the manner in which such acts records and proceedings shall be proved, and the effect thereof. Each state must recognize the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of other states. Section 2. Privileges and Immunities The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. A person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crime, who shall flee from justice and be found in another state, shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. No person held to service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. 
Citizens of each state are entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizens in other states. It also includes provisions for extradition of criminals. Section 3. New States and Territories New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states, or parts of states, without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of the Congress. The Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. And nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular state. Congress has the power to admit new states and manage federal territories. New states cannot be formed within existing states without consent. Section 4. Guarantee of Republican Government The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. The federal government must guarantee each state a republic for a government and protect them against invasion and domestic insurrection. Article 5. Amending the Constitution The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes, as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state, without its consent, shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Article 5 describes the amendment process. Amendments can be proposed either by a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress or by a national convention called by two-thirds of state legislatures. To become effective, amendments must be ratified by three-fourths of the states. Article 6, Supremacy of the Constitution. All debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution, shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state, to the contrary notwithstanding. The senators and representatives before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Article 6 establishes the Constitution federal laws, and treaties as the supreme law of the land. It requires all government officials to take an oath to support the Constitution but prohibits religious tests for office holders. Article 7, Ratification The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states so ratifying the same. The word, the, being interlined between the seventh and eighth lines of the first page, the word 30 being partly written on an erasure in the 15th line of the first page, the words is tried, being interlined between the 32nd and 33rd lines of the first page, and the word the being interlined between the 43rd and 44th lines of the second page, attest William Jackson's secretary, done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states, present the 17th day of September, in the year of our Lord 1787, and of the independence of the United States of America, the twelfth in witness whereof, we have hereunto subscribed our names. Article 7 outlines the process for ratifying the Constitution. It required the approval of nine out of the thirteen original states for the Constitution to become effective. 
At the end, there are a bunch of signatures. The amendments. The Constitution has 27 amendments. The first 10 are known as the Bill of Rights, protecting freedoms like speech, religion, and the right to a fair trial. Later amendments address issues like abolishing slavery, 13th Amendment, granting women the right to vote, 19th Amendment, and limiting presidential terms, 22nd Amendment. We'll go through them all now. The Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was introduced to safeguard individual liberties and prevent government overreach. Let's break down each of these critical amendments. Amendment 1, freedom of speech, religion, press, assembly, and petition. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The First Amendment guarantees the freedom of speech, religion, press, assembly, and the right to petition the government. This means you can speak your mind, practice your religion, publish opinions, gather peacefully, and ask the government for change without fear of punishment. Amendment 2. Right to bear arms. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. The Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms. Originally intended to ensure a well-regulated militia, today it is interpreted as an individual's right to own firearms. Amendment 3. No quartering of soldiers. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house, without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. The Third Amendment prohibits the government from forcing citizens to house soldiers during peacetime. This was a reaction to British practices during the colonial period. Amendment 4. Protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, against unreasonable searches and seizures, shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched, and the persons or things to be seized. The Fourth Amendment safeguards against unreasonable searches and seizures. It ensures that law enforcement must obtain a warrant based on probable cause before searching your property. Amendment 5. Rights in Criminal Cases No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The Fifth Amendment provides several protections for people accused of crimes, including the right against self-incrimination, pleading the Fifth, protection from double jeopardy, being tried twice for the same crime, and the right to due process. It also includes the Takings Clause, which states that private property cannot be taken for public use without just compensation. Amendment 6, Right to a Fair Trial In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury, the right to be informed of criminal charges, the right to confront witnesses, and the right to legal counsel. Amendment 7. Right to a jury trial in civil cases. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. 
the Seventh Amendment ensures the right to a jury trial in civil cases where the value in controversy exceeds $20. This amendment preserves the right to trial by jury in common law cases. Amendment 8. No cruel and unusual punishment. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. The Eighth Amendment prohibits excessive bail, excessive fines, and cruel and unusual punishment. This ensures that punishments are fair, humane, and proportional to the crime. Amendment 9. Rights retained by the people. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The Ninth Amendment states that the listing of specific rights in the Constitution does not mean that other unlisted rights are not protected. This protects rights that are not explicitly mentioned. Amendment 10. Powers reserved to the states. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. The Tenth Amendment reaffirms that any powers not delegated to the federal government by the Constitution, nor prohibited to the states, are reserved for the states or the people. This amendment emphasizes the principle of federalism. The Eleventh through Twenty-Seventh Amendments Following the Bill of Rights, additional amendments were added to address evolving issues in American society. Amendment 11, Lawsuits Against States, 1795 the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity, commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state, or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. The Eleventh Amendment restricts the ability of individuals to bring suit against states in federal court. This was passed to limit the power of federal courts over state governments. Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution was modified by the Eleventh Amendment. Amendment 12, Presidential Elections, 1804. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom, at least, shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. They shall name in their ballots the person voted for as president, and in distinct ballots the person voted for as vice president, and they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president, and of all persons voted for as vice president and of the number of votes for each, which lists they shall sign and certify, and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes for President shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if no person have such majority, then from the persons having the highest numbers, not exceeding three on the list of those voted for as president, the House of Representatives shall choose immediately, by ballot, the president. But in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by states, the representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two-thirds of the states, and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. And if the House of Representatives shall not choose a president, whenever the right of choice shall devolve upon them, before the fourth day of March next following, then the vice president shall act as president, as in case of the death or other constitutional disability of the president. The person having the greatest number of votes as vice president shall be the vice president, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, and if no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list, the Senate shall choose the Vice President. A quorum for the purpose shall consist of two-thirds of the whole number of Senators, and a majority of the whole number shall be necessary to a choice. But no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of President shall be eligible to that of Vice President of the United States. The Twelfth Amendment revises the procedure for electing the President and Vice President. It ensures that electors cast separate ballots for each office, preventing ties and confusion in the Electoral College. Some of Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution was changed by the Twelfth Amendment. Amendment 13, Abolition of Slavery, 1865. Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, 
except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The Thirteenth Amendment abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. This marked a significant step towards civil rights and equality in the United States. Some of Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution was changed by the Thirteenth Amendment. Amendment 14, Citizenship and Equal Protection, 1868. Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Section 2. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for President and Vice President of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof, is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being twenty-one years of age and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion, or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens, twenty-one years of age in such state. Section 3. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States, or under any state, who, having previously taken an oath, as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. Section 4. The validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave. But all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. Section 5. The Congress shall have power to enforce, by appropriate legislation, the provisions of this article. The Fourteenth Amendment grants citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States, including formerly enslaved people. It also includes the Equal Protection Clause, which guarantees equal protection of the laws to all citizens, serving as a cornerstone for civil rights legislation. Section 3 prohibits those who have engaged in rebellion or insurrection from holding office again. Section 2 of the 14th Amendment altered Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution. Amendment 15, Voting Rights for All Races, 1870. Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The Fifteenth Amendment prohibits the federal and state governments from denying a citizen the right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Amendment 16. Income Tax, 1913. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes, from whatever source derived, without apportionment among the several states, and without regard to any census or enumeration. The Sixteenth Amendment allows Congress to levy an income tax without apportioning it among the states or basing it on the U.S. Census. This provided a steady source of revenue for the federal government. The Sixteenth Amendment altered Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution.
Amendment 17, Direct Election of Senators, 1913. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, elected by the people thereof, for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. The electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislatures. When vacancies happen in the representation of any state in the Senate, the executive authority of such state shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies, provided that the legislature of any state may empower the executive thereof to make temporary appointments until the people fill the vacancies by election as the legislature may direct. This amendment shall not be so construed as to affect the election or term of any senator chosen before it becomes valid as part of the Constitution. The 17th Amendment established the direct election of U.S. senators by popular vote rather than being chosen by state legislatures. This change aimed to reduce corruption and increase democratic representation. The 17th Amendment altered Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution. Amendment 18, Prohibition of Alcohol, 1919. Section 1. After one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States, and all territory subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes, is hereby prohibited. Section 2. The Congress and the several states shall have concurrent power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Section 3. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of the several states, as provided in the Constitution, within seven years from the date of the submission hereof to the states by the Congress. The 18th Amendment prohibited the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcoholic beverages. This era, known as Prohibition, was later deemed a failure due to widespread noncompliance and was eventually repealed. Amendment 19, Women's Suffrage, 1920. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote, marking a major victory for the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Amendment 20, Terms of the President and Congress, 1933. Section 1. The terms of the President and the Vice President shall end at noon on the 20th day of January, and the terms of Senators and Representatives at noon on the 3rd day of January, of the years in which such terms would have ended if this article had not been ratified, and the terms of their successors shall then begin. Section 2. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meetings shall begin at noon on the 3rd day of January, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. Section 3. If, at the time fixed for the beginning of the term of the President, the President-elect shall have died, the Vice-President-elect shall become President. If a President shall not have been chosen before the time fixed for the beginning of his term, or if the President-elect shall have failed to qualify, then the Vice-President-elect shall act as President until a President shall have qualified. And the Congress may by law provide for the case wherein neither a President-elect nor a vice president elect shall have qualified, declaring who shall then act as president, or the manner in which one who is to act shall be selected, and such person shall act accordingly until a president or vice president shall have qualified. Section 4. The Congress may by law provide for the case of the death of any of the persons from whom the House of Representatives may choose a president whenever the right of choice shall have devolved upon them and for the case of the death of any of the persons from whom the Senate may choose a vice president whenever the right of choice shall have devolved upon them. Section 5. Sections 1 and 2 shall take effect on the 15th day of October, following the ratification of this article. Section 6. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission. The 20th Amendment, also known as the Lame Duck Amendment, changed the start dates for presidential and congressional terms to reduce the transition period, 
It also clarified the line of succession if the president-elect dies before taking office. The 20th Amendment altered Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution, and a portion of the 12th Amendment. Amendment 21, Repeal of Prohibition, 1933. Section 1. The 18th Article of Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. Section 2. The transportation or importation into any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery, or use therein of intoxicating liquors, in violation of the laws thereof, is hereby prohibited. Section 3. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution, by conventions in the several states, as provided in the Constitution, within seven years from the date of the submission hereof to the states by the Congress. The 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment, ending the prohibition of alcohol. This is the only amendment that repeals a previous one. Amendment 22, Presidential Term Limits, 1951. Section 1. No person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice, and no person who has held the office of president or acted as president for more than two years of a term to which some other person was elected president shall be elected to the office of the president more than once. But this article shall not apply to any person holding the office of president when this article was proposed by the Congress, and shall not prevent any person who may be holding the office of president or acting as president during the term within which this article becomes operative, from holding the office of president or acting as president during the remainder of such term. Section 2. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission to the states by the Congress. The 22nd Amendment limits the president to two terms in office, or a maximum of 10 years if they assume the presidency due to succession. This is sometimes called the FDR Amendment. Amendment 23, Voting Rights for Washington, D.C., 1961. Section 1. The district, constituting the seat of government of the United States, shall appoint in such manner as the Congress may direct. A number of electors of president and vice president equal to the whole number of senators and representatives in Congress, to which the district would be entitled, if it were a state, but in no event more than the least populous state. They shall be in addition to those appointed by the states, but they shall be considered, for the purposes of the election of president and vice president, to be electors appointed by a state, and they shall meet in the district and perform such duties as provided by the Twelfth Article of Amendment. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 23rd Amendment grants residents of Washington, D.C. the right to vote for president and vice president by giving the district electors in the Electoral College. Amendment 24, Abolition of Poll Taxes, 1964. Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States to vote in any primary or other election for president or vice president for electors for president or vice president, or for senator or representative in Congress, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state by reason of failure to pay any poll tax or other tax. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 24th Amendment prohibits the use of poll taxes in federal elections, removing a barrier that had been primarily used to disenfranchise black voters. Amendment 25, Presidential Succession, 1967. Section 1. In case of the removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. Section 2. Whenever there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. Section 3. Whenever the President transmits to the President pro temper of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, and until he transmits to them a written declaration to the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the Vice President as Acting President. Section 4. Whenever the Vice President and a majority of either the principal officers of the Executive Departments 
or of such other body as Congress, may by law provide, transmit to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, their written declaration that the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. The Vice President shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting President. Thereafter, when the President transmits to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that no inability exists, he shall resume the powers and duties of his office unless the Vice President and a majority of either the principal officers of the Executive Department or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit within four days to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. Thereupon, Congress shall decide the issue, assembling within 48 hours for that purpose if not in session. If the Congress, within 21 days after receipt of the latter written declaration, or if Congress is not in session, within 21 days after Congress is required to assemble, determines by two-thirds vote of both houses, that the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. The Vice President shall continue to discharge the same as Acting President. Otherwise, the President shall resume the powers and duties of his office. The 25th Amendment clarifies the line of succession for the Presidency and establishes procedures for filling a vacancy in the office of the Vice President. It also allows for the temporary transfer of presidential power if the President is incapacitated. The 25th Amendment altered Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution. Amendment 26, Voting Age Lowered to 18, 1971. Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States, who are 18 years of age or older, to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of age. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 26th Amendment lowers the voting age from 21 to 18 in response to arguments that those old enough to be drafted for military service should also have the right to vote. The 14th Amendment, Section 2, was changed by Section 1 of the 26th Amendment. Amendment 27, Congressional Pay Raises, 1992. No law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. The 27th Amendment prevents members of Congress from granting themselves pay raises during the current session. Any salary increases can only take effect after the next election. And there you have it, a detailed breakdown of the U.S. Constitution, from the foundational principles set forth in the preamble to the rights and freedoms guaranteed by the amendments, this document is a living, evolving framework that continues to guide the United States. Understanding the Constitution is essential for all Americans, as it defines the rights we enjoy and the limits on government power. Thank you for joining us on this journey through one of the most important documents in history. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the world of information at your fingertips. If you found this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and share with others.